Well, good morning. Let's turn in our Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 1. And happy, happy Mother's Day. It's great to see you all here this morning. If you've been a part of this church for very long, you know that it is uh, very, very seldom I, uh, that I depart from the text. I believe in teaching through the Bible, verse by verse, and it's very seldom that I'll ever depart from the text that we're making our way through. And we've been making our way through the book of Romans, uh, the 10th chapter. Uh, but the last few days I've been, I haven't been able to get past this feeling. I've had the, had the sense that our mothers and, and our families, especially our mothers, need some encouragement during these days. And uh, I mean, for goodness sake, they have been educating their own children at home. They need some encouragement. But uh, so we're going to take a little break from the book of Romans this morning. I'm going to ask you to look over at 1 Samuel chapter 1. And we're going to talk about the subject marks of a mighty mother. The Bible commands us to honor our fathers and our mothers. And so what we're doing here this morning is biblical. We are setting aside one day, we do that every year, to just show mom that we appreciate her and tell her we love her and appreciate all she has done. That is a biblical thing to honor our mothers and our fathers. And that really, we should do that every day of the year. My wife, I look at the things she goes through. She's been married to me for uh, 28 years. Uh, she raises, she raised two kids and married them off. And the two that she has left, we look at what she puts up with every day. She deserves to have breakfast in bed and an entire hillside of daffodils and daisies brought to her every morning of her life for everything that she's done and put up with over the years. But uh, mothers are the first point of influence in our lives. The first person, you know, we look up and, and see and, and, and they hold us in our arms. They, they're the first ones to feed us, the first one to, to care for us. Your mother has done so much for you. Your mother, after carrying you in her body for nine months or, or, or maybe a little less, maybe a little more, and some of you were bigger than others, and you should apologize to your mother. But after carrying you in her body for nine months or more or less, or somewhere around there, then she went through a terrifying and painful experience. And whether it was surgical or whether it was natural procedure, it was terrifying and it was painful. It doesn't matter. It was terrifying. It's scary just to bring a child into the world. And your mother went through that. And she would gladly do it again just to bring you into the world. That's how much your mom loves you. 
Your mom loves you with a fierce love. Your mother is most likely the only person in the world, if you needed a kidney or if you needed a heart, she would gladly lay down on the table and demand that the doctor take hers right now and give it to you. That's how much she loves you. Jesus, when he was trying to describe his love for the children of Israel, for the people of Israel, he, uh, in Matthew 23, said uh, these words. He said, I wanted to gather you together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and protects them. That's what Jesus said. He, he used it to describe his own love. And you know how much he loved us? He went to a cross and died for us. And that's what Jesus said. He said, I, I've loved you. I wanted to love you like that. Uh, it's a fierce love with which a mother loves her children. And moms are to be commended for that. Sometimes we don't give mom all the love that she deserves. Sometimes we're disobedient and rebellious, and, and, uh, but, but, he, but she loves us anyway, and just like the Lord loves us anyway, even though sometimes we're disobedient and we're rebellious. Just think about all the things that your mother taught you, all the things, all the lessons that came from her. My mother taught me all about personal responsibility. She said, if you guys are going to kill each other, go outside because I've already cleaned. <laughs> my mother taught me about religion. She said, you better pray that comes out in my carpet. <laughs> my mother taught me about the coming judgment. She said, wait till your father gets home. My mother taught me about logic and reasoning. She said, because I said so, that's why. My mother taught me about time travel. She said, if you don't stop it, I'm going to knock you into the middle of next week. My mother taught me about the law of sowing and reaping. She said, one of these days you're going to have kids, and I pray that they turn out exactly like you did. A lady at Walmart was pushing her grocery cart through the store, and she had a little girl in the front of that, in the seat of that buggy, and the little girl was screaming, and she was crying, and, and she wouldn't calm down. And so her mother was talking and said, uh, calm down, Susie. It's going to be okay, Susie. And the baby continued to scream and to cry. She said, take it easy, Susie. Be patient, Susie, just a little while longer. It won't be long, and we'll be home, Susie. And so as she continued through the store, she got ready to leave. One of the employees came over to him, and, and she said to her, uh, Ma'am, I just want to compliment you on how gentle and how calm and how patient you have been with little Susie. She said, lady, you don't know a thing. I'm Susie. <laughs> Moms put up with a lot, don't they? Well, we look to our text this morning, 1 Samuel chapter 1. And this book tells us an amazing story. We're not going to look at the whole book today, but just a little bit of the first chapter, pretty much most of the first chapter. But this book tells us an amazing story about an amazing man that God raised up. He was a man that God raised up to be a prophet and a priest in the nation of Israel. His name was Samuel. And uh, the things, the message that God gave Samuel to speak and the things that God commanded Samuel to do were things that would forever change the nation of Israel and would forever change the entire world. God did great things through Samuel's ministry. Samuel grew up during a very dark time in Israel's history. It was a very dark time. And uh, there was wickedness in the priest's house. It was a very uh, corrupt, some corrupt things going on. There was a priest named Eli, and he was kind of half-hearted, and he had two sons named Hophni and Phinehas who were kind of working for him, and they were stealing offerings from the Lord's offerings that were coming into the house of the Lord, stealing from it for themselves. They were also uh, having sexual relations with the women that were coming up to the temple um, to uh, for, for worship, and they were taking advantage of that situation. And Eli, Eli, he talked to him a little bit, but he really didn't do anything to stop them from doing these wicked acts. He, he, he just kind of let it go on. But the Lord began to speak through Samuel the prophet when he was a very young boy growing up in Eli's house. He was a very young boy, and the Lord proclaimed through Samuel the, the judgment of God that was going to come upon Eli's house. The Lord uh, 
proclaim that judgment through Samuel. And the Lord caused all of Samuel's words. He confirmed all of Samuel's words and caused them to come true. That judgment came. Eli and his two wicked sons, Hophni and Phinehas, died. And the glory of God departed from Israel during that time because of the wickedness that was going on in Israel. But Samuel was a great prophet and a priest. The Lord made him to, into a great prophet and a priest in the eyes of all Israel. But just know that before we get to the story of Samuel the prophet and priest, before we get to that, God has another story for us. God has a story of a godly mother. God has a story of, that he wants to share with us. It starts with a woman whose name was Hannah. And as we make our way through the scripture, I want you to notice five distinguishing characteristics of a godly mother, five marks of a mighty mother. And I want you to see these things in this woman, Hannah's life, as we look through the scripture. The first thing we're going to see this morning is that a, a, a mighty mother perseveres in problems. She keeps on going. She doesn't quit. She doesn't give up. Verse number one of 1 Samuel chapter one says, there was a certain man of Ramathaim Zophim, can you say that? Ramathaim Zophim, of the mountains of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah. Going down to verse two, it says, he had two wives. <laughs> right? We're going to hit the brakes right there for a second. That's a problem, right? Yeah, Y'all okay with it? Okay, no, that's a problem. He had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and the other was Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. So right off from the start, we begin to see that Hannah is a woman who is living in, with some major discouraging problems in her life. First, she's married to a man who has another wife. He's an adulterer. And even though polygamy was more common in ancient times. Even though we see through the Bible some of the great men that God used actually were engaged in some level of polygamy, yet this was never something that God approved, never something that God excused, never. God always commanded, thou shalt not commit adultery. Uh, men were supposed to be with one wife and, and, one, hu and one husband. That was all that was it was supposed to be. Adultery was always forbidden by God. And it was a recipe for sadness, and it was a recipe for bitterness, and it was a recipe for pain. If you look back in Abraham's life, Abraham resorted to polygamy. Uh, he took on a handmaid. And this caused hurt in his wife Sarah's life eventually between those two women. You see the same thing with Jacob because he wanted to marry Rachel, but his father snuck the ugly daughter into the tent first, Leah. And when he woke up in the morning, the Bible says, behold, it was Leah. And he was pretty upset about that. And so he worked another seven years to marry Rachel. And so he was married to two women and he was kind of deceived. But, but uh, this caused tension between those two women. There was hurt in the family because these men were committing the sin of adultery. And we see that here. We see that here in Hannah's family situation. The second problem Hannah was facing was the, the sadness and the despair of infertility. And a lot of people have struggled with that over the years. And those two examples, uh, uh, that first example that I showed you a while ago of Abraham, uh, he was struggling with that for many, many years. He struggled. Even though God had promised him that he was going to have a child, him and his wife Sarah were struggling with the sadness of infertility. And most young couples do desire to, during their lifetime, bring some children, at least some children, into this world when the time is right for them. Back in the Bible days, it was more of a passion. They were more interested in this, very, very eager to have children. And it was like the more children you have, the better. The Bible tells us in the book of Psalms that blessed is the man. Uh, you know, he said children are a gift, a heritage from the Lord, and blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. A quiver is that little thing that a warrior carries on his back. He puts his arrow in it. He wants a, uh, he wants a quiver full of arrows. He wants a quiver full of children. And uh, so, so it was a great blessing. Consider, and, and people wanted to have children, but a lot of people we find in the scriptural account struggled with the sadness and the disappointment and the despair. They were, having, they were trying to have children, and they couldn't have them. At the same time, there's kind of a stigma that they went through here. And, and one would have to wonder, uh, why is God punishing me and not allowing me to have a child, not, although I don't believe God's 
punishing people like that. But that thought process always enters in. Now back then, when a couple was uh, trying to have children, and when they had been, when a young couple had been married for just a little while, somebody's trying to call you Miss Joyce, go ahead and get that. Uh, but, but back then when, a, when a, couple, a young couple was trying to have children, and they had been trying for a little while, and they hadn't been able, a lot of times this is what the man would do, is he would take a second wife, because he didn't want to go through life without having any more children. That's what Abraham did. You can read about the whole Jerry Springer type arrangement between him and his wife Sarah and, and this handmaid Hagar. And it was, it was a, it's, it's a, a nasty little story that's right there in the Bible. People did it. It wasn't right, but people did that. He, he tried to, and, and the Lord came back and he said, no, this is not going to be your heir, Abraham. This is not the child that I promised. And a lot of times that happened. And that's, you know, so, but Jacob had a second wife. Abraham had a second wife. Many people we find in history that, that did that. That's what happened. And you can only imagine how painful this must have been for Hannah. Because this was her husband that had married her. He tried for a while to have children and they were not able to. And eventually he gave up on her and took a second wife. And she feels devastatingly hurt. She feels that she has failed her husband. That's what happened here. She, must, she felt like a failure, and her husband was giving up on her. Now watch this, verse 4 of 1 Samuel 1. Verse 4 says, Whenever the time came for Elkanah to make an offering, her husband, he would make an offering, he would give portions to Penina, his wife, and uh, to all her sons and daughters, but to Hannah he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb. So her husband could see that uh, she was hurting from all this. He, he, he could see that there was a lot of heartbreak she was walking around with. And so at least, you know, he did try in some way, even though he was an adulterer and a, a polygamer, he did try in a small way to encourage her and, and just show her, he, you know, when he passed out the food, he gave her twice as much as he gave anybody else in the family. He wanted to show her that he loved her uh, and, and, and try to kind of make her feel better that way. In verse 6, though, goes on. Watch what it says in verse 6. It says, and her rival, who do you think her rival was? That other wife, Penina. Her rival also provoked her severely to make her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. So it was year by year when she went up to the house of the Lord that she provoked her. Why, why would she provoke her? Because she's married to her husband. They're both married to the same man, and, and so they, des they despise each other. They, they, they have feelings of resentment toward each other. And so she's provoking Hannah. She's uh, mocking and ridiculing her because she can't have children. She's rubbing her face in it that she couldn't have any children. But look at verse number 7. Second part of verse number 7, her husband comes to her. He uh, says, therefore she wept and did not eat. This has really upset her. She wept and did not eat. It says, then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? And why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? Okay, let's stop for a second again. Uh, Hannah, I'm so good to you. Look, look at these double portions that I have given you. Hannah, uh, am I not better to you than, than if you had ten sons? Well, maybe we could kind of say that if you hadn't given up on me and married another lady... Huh? Here this guy is, and he, he's broken his wife's heart by giving up on her. And then he wants to brag about how great he is, how good he's been to her. And that's just really something else. It's just really something. This man really thought he was a great husband because he was giving twice as much food to her as he gave to all the other people and his other wife. Do you, do you hear how ridiculous that sounds? She didn't want extra food. She wanted her husband not to give up on her. That's what she wanted. And so she didn't eat that extra food. It just made her sad. That just made her sad. That didn't help her at all. So not only was Hannah struggling with infertility, and not only did she have this deep hurt because of this other woman that was uh, ridiculing her and, and vexing her and, and reminding her of the problem of, of infertility in her life, but on top of everything else, she had an adulterous husband that thought he was God's gift to woman and the best husband that ever lived. 
And he's bragging about how great he's been. So why are you crying? Guys, don't minimize your wife's problems when she comes to you and she's upset about something. Don't cut her off and say, well, I've just been so good for you. You should never complain. You're not perfect. Listen to your wife. Be sensitive to her. Hannah was a woman who was suffering with a lot of very real problems. And maybe you've come in here this morning and maybe your family kind of sounds like Hannah's family. Maybe your family's kind of messed up. Maybe you could go on one of the talk shows and everybody scream and breaks out into a fight. Maybe you are tied up in a family situation like that and maybe you've been a little embarrassed. Maybe you don't want people to know what your family's like. But I just want you to know that, that God looked down at this lady here, Hannah, and even though she's going through some things right now, God had an awesome plan to do something great in her future. No matter how messed up things might be in your family, God could have a very good plan like this for your family as well. Don't despair. Don't give up. Uh, he had a great future plan for this, lady, this little lady here. Beauty was about to arise out of the ashes of her family life. Now, I don't know why so many times God allows people to struggle through uh, the sadness of infertility. Young couples, uh, sometimes we see people who are addicted to drugs and uh, they're in and out of prison, yet they're having four, five, six, seven, eight kids easily. And then someone else who's just uh, good living a clean life, struggling, doing everything they can medically, morally, physically, everything they can to try to bring children in the world and they're struggling with it and they haven't had any success. I don't know why God allows people to go through that, but I do think God is wise. And let me just give you a couple of things that uh, I've observed over the years. Number one, I think that a lot of times people go through that struggle because God has a plan for them to adopt a child. I think sometimes that's just God's plan, and I've seen that. I've seen couples get together, and they've tried to have a child for 10, 11, 12 years, and they're just struggling. They're, they're, they're devastated, and then all of a sudden they say, you know what, let's, let's adopt a child. There's plenty of children out there that don't have a, a mother and father that love them, and so they adopt a child, and, and this little child that God has planned to come into their home comes into their home. They adopt this child, and they pour their love into this child, and then a couple months later, boom, they're pregnant. And then the floodgates open. And then they start having kids, you know, every couple of years after that. And they're like, what the heck happened? I thought you couldn't have any. Well, God knew that had they not struggled through that infertility all those years, they would not have had that child and adopted that child that God planned for them to bring into their home. Maybe adopting a child or maybe fostering a child or something like that. That is a great, great thing. God is big into adoption because God adopted every one of us. Amen. He's taken us rugrats out of the terrible family we were in, and he's adopted into us into his family, and he has loved us. Maybe another reason that some people struggle with infertility, maybe God has a different calling than being a phys physical mother. And, and what I like to call this kind of person is a mother at heart. We've had so many people that we've known over the years here in this church who've never been able to have a child themselves, but oh, how they have loved. They have loved children that come into our Sunday school and they have taught them the Word of God week by week, year after year. They've called them whenever they uh, weren't at Sunday school. Maybe they were out sick. They have loved. They have greeted them here at the door. And they have, they have been what I call mothers at heart. They couldn't have their own children physically, but maybe God had another plan. Sometimes God sends people to a different country as a missionary, and they've never been able to have any children of their own, but they go to another land. God has a different plan for their life than for them to have a children. And it's a purpose that God can eventually give them joy in, even though they may struggle with the feelings that infertility brings. Another thing that I've noticed over the years as well, another reason I think that some people struggle under the sadness of infertility, and they do it for a while. I think that one of the reasons God allows that is sometimes the longer someone waits, the more precious the gift of a child is when the child finally comes. 
And it, because I've seen this before. People couldn't have children for years, you know. And, you know, you got somebody like me and Bridget. We got, we got four kids, you know. Time we brought our third one home, we're like, okay, you're home. Junk, you know, throw them over there. But you'll see these people that for years have been trying, and finally God blesses them with a baby. And maybe they struggled through medical problems, but just to get them home, and they're bringing that child home. It's like the Holy Grail, you know, and they're bringing it in and just laying it. And just, they have poured so much love. God wanted a greater love and a greater value placed on that child's life, and so he let them wait so it would be worth more to them. And I don't know all the reasons, but there's just a few ideas about why sometimes people struggle, and maybe there's something else you're going through and you don't understand, but I want you to know that God loves you, and God has a plan, and we don't know what it is always, but there's something special God's going to do. The second thing we see, the second mark of a mighty mother is that she prays persistently. We're going to move through the rest of these pretty quick because I took a lot of time on that first point. Believe it or not, we're going to move quick. Verse 10, she was in bitterness of soul, and so she did what? She prayed to the Lord. That's what you do when you're in bitterness of soul. You don't whine about it. You don't obsess about it. You don't complain about it. You don't give up. You pray. You go, you can't do it yourself, so you go to the one who can. She was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. Then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall come upon his head. She made a Nazarite vow. This child was going to be dedicated as a servant in the Lord's house. Hannah was enduring through some really big problems, and she was struggling, and it made her heart sad. The strength she was tapping into here, though, was that of of prayer and there's phenomenal strength in prayer and I don't think there's a more powerful force on earth than that of a mother's prayer my mother's prayers have stayed with me all my life I don't know where I'd be without them. look at verse 12 it happened as she and look at this it says continued praying you see that she hadn't just said a little prayer and then quit and gave up. Well, I asked God and he didn't help me. She continued praying before the Lord that Eli watched her mouth. He's sitting there watching her pray. Maybe he should have been praying, but he's sitting there watching her mouth. You remember this guy? He's the one that didn't raise his kids right. He's the one that had two disobedient, rebellious sons that were taking advantage of him in the temple and he, of, his, of their office, and he wasn't doing anything about it. He's looking on this woman, and he sees her lips moving. But she couldn't hear anything coming out. Eli watched her mouth. Now Hannah spoke in her heart, only her lips moved. But her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, how long will you be drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered and said, no, my Lord, I, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I've drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Do not consider your maidservant a wicked woman, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief I have spoken until now. Then Eli answered and said, go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition which you have asked him. And she said, let your maidservant find favor in your sight. So the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. Remember how sorrow, sorrowful she was before? And how she wouldn't eat before, and now she's eating, and now her face is no longer sad. And you know what did that? It was prayer. She went to praying to the Lord. And, and prayer will encourage you when you're down. Prayer can tap into that strength that you need when you're down and when you're discouraged. You don't know how you're going to make it. But she was no longer sad. She was encouraged after a time of prayer. And so I encourage you to, to pray. So verse number 19, she had prayed. It made her feel better. But not only that, verse number 19 says, Then they rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord and returned and came to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah knew his wife. Y'all know what that means, don't you? It gets rated R right here, okay? They took their marital privileges together. It's children's churches in here, so we're going to say it like that. And the Lord remembered her. So it came to pass in process of time that Hannah conceived and bore a son and called his name the Hebrew Samuel. Samuel, which means heard. 
I prayed, and God heard me. God heard my prayer. He granted my request. She named her child. That says, because I have asked for him from the Lord. And so she prayed persistently, and the Lord granted her request. A third mark of a mighty mother is that she pro prioritizes properly. Can you say that? She prioritizes properly. I mean, she's got the right order of what's most important in her life. And in verse number 21, it says, Now the man Elkanah and his house went up to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and his vow. But Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, Not until the child is weaned, then I will take him, that he may appear before the Lord and remain there forever. So Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Do what seems best to you. Wait until you have weaned him. Only let the Lord establish his word. Then the woman stayed and nursed her son until she had weaned him. Now we hear the word weaned today, and we just kind of think about a baby that's grown out of its mother's feedings, you know. Maybe uh, got past the, the mother feeding it the natural way that God gave the mother where she can feed it, or or maybe the baby has given up the bottle, you know, and graduated up to a sippy cup. We say the baby is weaned now. But the weaning that we see here, to be weaned in this sense, it comes from the word gamal, Hebrew word gamal, and it really involves a lot more. It speaks of working very hard, toiling to love and treat a person very well. And this word also carries the idea of a piece of fruit that is not picked until it's fully ripe, okay? If you pick it too early, it's not ready, and it's not going to taste right. It's not going to be nearly as sweet. And Hannah was saying to her husband, I know my boy that I brought into the world, and so I'm not going to take him up there. She's not just talking about getting him out of, off of a bottle into a sippy cup. She, sa she says, I'm going to raise this child and I'm going to teach him, and I'm going to nurture him, and I'm going to love him, and I'm going to pour my heart into him so that I can give him a good foundation, and I can guide him into a good direction. I'm going to raise this child with the, the love that only a mother can. I'm not just dropping him up there with Eli, because I've seen how Hophni and Phinehas act. I'm not just going to take my little toddler up there and drop him off there, but I'm going to raise him enough to where he'll be fully developed to where he needs to be for what he's going to do. To where he will remember what I have instilled in him. Where he'll be a loved boy, where he will be a good boy that I can take there, and then God can do the rest. And you know who knew when the time was right? Not Elkanah. Not, her, not his daddy. He was just kind of there. But the one who knew was his mother. Only his mother knew when she had got him to that point where it was time. Somewhere between three and five years old, the child was very young, the Bible tells us. And so she did a very important work there. You know, there's uh, 435 representatives in Washington, D.C. There's 100 uh, senators. There's a president. There's a vice president. I don't think there's any of them. I don't think there's any of them that have ever done anything as important as what Hannah did in those few years that she spent with that little child of hers. And I don't think there's any of them, as much as they get paid, who do anything as near as important as what you ladies do as mothers, as godly mothers who love your kids and raise your kids. It's infinitely more important. I don't care what the world says about what success is. Real success is being a godly mother and raising your children. You will make more of an impact on this world by raising your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. A fourth thing that we find here, a fourth mark of a godly mother, she promises and performs. In verse 24, when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with three bulls, one ephah of flour, and a skin of wine. People kind of assume that's uh, all for sacrifice, probably, but, you know, kids got to eat. So she didn't come up there and just drop her kid off there. She brought some food. <laughs> they had a barbecue. And she brought some extra. Brought him to the house of the Lord in Shiloh. The child was young. He's somewhere between three and five years old. Then they slaughtered a bull 
and brought the child to Eli. And she said, oh, my Lord, as your soul lives, my Lord, I am the woman who stood by you here praying to the Lord for this child. And I prayed and the Lord has granted me my position, petition, which I asked of him. Therefore, I also have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he shall be lent to the Lord. And I know this wasn't easy. I get visions here of Anakin Skywalker and his mother saying, now go. Don't look back. Okay. She sends her son off because she had committed to the Lord to do that. But, and I know this wasn't easy, but after weaning him, after, after uh, raising him up on the, carefully in the way that she did, after raising him up to this point in his life to such a godly and loving way, then there was one more important lesson that she needed to teach her son that would make a lasting impression and stand out above everything else that she ever taught him. And it is that God is the number one priority in our lives. And it is the most, the, the utmost importance that we obey him and that we serve him and that we keep our commitments to him. We belong to the Lord and our kids need to know that. Mothers, let me tell you this morning, when you trust your children into the Lord's hands, you give them to the Lord, then you can never lose them. Do you understand what I'm saying to you today? You give your children, trust them into the Lord's hands, you can never lose them. And I, I'm, I'm not just talking about in life, I'm talking about eternally. You can never lose them. Don't be like that one little family that went to church and they had a baby dedication that day and the, 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 the pastor preached about family and, and they got in the car and they were going home afterwards and the one of the little boys was in the back seat crying, about five, six years old. He's crying, just, just throwing a, a, a hissy fit and crying, upset, heartbroken. And, and his, his mother said, what's the matter? And he said, that preacher said that we need to live in a Christian family, but I want to live here with you guys. <laughs> they don't be like that family. <laughs> Kids are pretty honest, aren't they? Well, Hannah gave her child to the Lord, and you would think there would be a lot of misery over this decision. You would think, and I'm sure it was tough. I'm sure it wasn't easy. But she taught her child right. He became a mighty prophet. And so it brings us to the final point in our message, is that a mighty mother praises perfectly. And there at the very end of Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 1, in verse 28, the very last phrase there says, so they worship the Lord there. The family, they worship the Lord. There with Eli the priest, they worship the Lord. They gave their child to the Lord. They offered sacrifice to the Lord. And I'm not going to take you far through ch chapter 2, but I want to read the first verse. Hannah began to pray again. Remember, she prays persistently. She didn't stop. And Hannah prayed and said, my heart... She just dropped her son off with Eli to live with Eli and become a servant in the house of the Lord. And you might think she would say, oh, Lord, help me. My heart is so sorrowful. She said, my heart, what? Rejoices. It is full. That's right. It rejoices in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. The horn is power, right? And remember, she was so weak before, and, and that other woman ridiculed her and gave her a hard time and, and Hannah was powerless but now she has power. An animal has a horn on its head to defend itself and now she has power. My horn, my, my horn is exalted in the Lord. I smile at my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. It's a happy rejoicing prayer. On the day Hannah gave her child to the Lord, she finally found out what it meant to have real joy. Because she knew the Lord's going to do something very special and very great through his life. Moms, give your children to the world. And I promise you, you will regret it. I've seen it a hundred gazillion times, and I don't know if that's a real number, but it's a lot. You will regret it. But I promise you, 
Give your children to the Lord. You will never regret it. You will never be sorry. Never. Let's stand and let's pray.